Okay, this is a Paul Lynch, um, day 15 of my experience uh, working in New York City during the uh, COVID pandemic. Um, uh, I say working because this is actually day four of my quarantine, which has um, become kind of difficult, um, but I'm hanging in there. Um, most of my video today is going to be teaching um, because I really didn't have much going on and um, you know nothing to really uh, share from the front line. So um, I reviewed some of the literature and looked at the data and hopefully you'll enjoy the teaching point. Uh, today I'm going to do a part two of a systems-based uh, approach of how COVID affects our bodies. Um, I do just want to share a little bit, um, I guess, personal stuff with you guys today. Um, it was uh, a little bit disappointing. Um, I haven't had fevers um, since Tuesday. So I was really, uh, you know, hoping that I could return to work tomorrow. The CDC basically says if you're exposed and then um, you're fever-free for 72 hours, then it's probably okay to return to work. And so I was planning to be back at work tomorrow and then work the weekend um, before going back home next week. I had planned uh, 18 days here, and so um, I was going to stick with that plan. But I talked to uh, um, employee health today, and my test results um, still aren't back which is crazy. I don't know if they lost it or what, but they uh, they said that they want to wait till next week and then see me in person and then decide if I can return. And so, um, unfortunately, I think my, uh, my run here is over, which is kind of hard to take. Um, I really felt like I wanted to be on the front lines making a difference. And it's, uh, it's kind of a helpless feeling being in the, uh, um, being in the hotel room during all this. Um, but I'm, I've seen a lot of people writing about this disease as like a disease of uh, loneliness. And so um, I think in a small part, I can kind of relate to that. I, I want to I be at the hospital today or tomorrow seeing my mentors and my friends and, and most importantly, my patients. And, um, and instead, I'm here and I, and I feel kind of that loneliness a little bit, but only on a very small scale compared to what some of my patients are going through. Um, I took a photo of an employee that I interviewed earlier this week who was a social worker and her uh, her full-time role was doing uh, FaceTime funerals. I wanted to show you that picture. So you can see her here, um, basically letting the loved ones say goodbye to their family member for the last time. And uh, I just, I can't imagine um, going through that with someone that I loved. And so um, I wanted to share that with you guys today. Um, they call it a disease of loneliness for a reason because you know, we're practicing social isolation for a reason and we're, um, we're making sure that we don't catch it. But in the meantime, um, I think we're all kind of yearning for that human contact. And so I think this photo kind of describes that a little bit. That's pretty powerful. Um, you know, I say it's a disease of loneliness, but it's also um, a disease that I think is bringing out the best in us. Um, once again, my, uh, my mentor brought me chicken noodle soup today. Um, which is just pretty incredible for me to have one of the smartest people um, I've ever met in my life, uh, Ken Sutton, um, bring me chicken noodle soup and <laughs> make sure I'm okay in the hotel room. It's That's very touching. Um, a lot of people have asked me how I'm doing today, and if I'm honest, um, kind of uh, up and down. I, uh, um, I felt really great yesterday, and today I felt incredibly tired, so I spent most of the day um, in bed. Um, this video is probably coming out late tonight because... I had a hard time getting up um, just to make it. And so I'm definitely feeling that tiredness. My O2 stats are not as low as they were a couple days ago, but, um, but definitely lower than I would want. And so I continue to watch kind of my lungs and, uh, and my own body, but um, certainly I'm not out of the woods yet. So please keep me, uh, continue to keep me in your prayers. Um, you know, I'm gonna finish today by showing a video of my son again, because so many people ask me about him and I think you know, we have good days and bad days with him too. And it reminded me a little bit of me today. A lot of people have reached out and asked about my test. So I just, um, I'm gonna show you what I see. I log into the portal to look at my test every day and I've called a couple of times and this is, uh, this is what I see. So it basically says, um, no, I don't know, where does it say? You have no results to display, so. I, uh, at this point, I, I'm not, I'm not sure I'm ever going to get a test result. Um, but it's actually probably an important teaching point. You know, the, uh, the accuracy of these tests is only, 
um, probably 70, 90% accurate. Um, there's a large um, article written yesterday basically talking about how important it is for us to interpret tests wisely um, because there's such a high false negative rate if we have a uh, healthcare worker who has all the symptoms, fevers and uh, lung dysfunction and stuff like I've shown and they show up negative, sending them back to the hospital knowing that there's a 10 to 30 percent chance that they might have it would be a really bad move. So um, maybe it's a good opportunity for me to give that teaching point. Um, if I do get my results back, I'll update you guys. But as, as of this point, I'm not sure we're going to get it. And so I'm what we would call presumed um, positive. I want to jump into um, the teaching today. I spent a fair amount of time on this. Um, I hope you guys really enjoy this. I'm going to do part two of how COVID affects um, our body system by system. Yesterday I talked about um, the lungs and the cytokine storm and its initial entry into the body. Today I'm going to dig in a little deeper. Okay, so I wanted to start with um, the novel coronavirus's effects on the brain. Um, not because they're the most dramatic, but um, definitely some interesting uh, uh, things here. Um, <clears throat> first of all, one of the interesting things is how does the virus get into the brain in the, in the first place? And there's lots of you know theories on this. Research from the original um, SARS epidemic in 2003 um, definitely shows that the virus can directly um, infiltrate neurons. But a lot of um, uh, scientists are thinking that the olfactory nerve um, is uh, the most likely point of entry into the brain. And if you look here at the olfactory nerve, it has uh, nerves that um, extend into the sinuses. And so um, normally that's good so you can smell, but because um, there's so many ACE2 receptors in the nose and the nasopharynx and the sinuses, um, the virus is thought to kind of... Uh, gain entry into the brain through the uh, olfactory nerve. And that might be one of the reasons so many people have lost their uh, smell with us. Um, so there is data showing um, just in the last month that even with the novel coronavirus, um, that it's showing up in CSF. Um, and so we know it's getting into the brain. We're not completely sure how. Um, and there's lots of neurologists around the country right now that are, um, that are trying to figure out exactly all, what all the brain you know effects are. Um, we know that um, encephalitis occurs, which is like brain inflammation. There's like a sympathetic storm that occurs in the brain. It's kind of like the cytokine storm, you know, throughout the body. Um, patients are having seizures, um, uh, and certainly patients are having strokes. Um, I'm going to talk about the blood effects later, but because the blood is clotting um, uh, irregularly, um, in many patients with coronavirus, that's cutting off blood flow to the brain. There's even hypoxemia, which means decrease in oxygen um, because of the lung effects, and so that's slowly killing um, neurons. One thing that's kind of interesting, um, you can see the brain stem here, which is the part of the brain that kind of sticks down, um, and um, many patients are showing up in the emergency room with incredibly low oxygen saturations in the 60s or 70s, and they don't really feel like they, they're struggling to breathe. And we think that that is kind of a down regulation of the brain steps, um, uh, the brain stems drive to breathe. And I can tell you anecdotally that I've experienced that. Uh, personally this week, I've been checking my respiratory rate every day and it's been between you know five and seven, where normally you should be breathing 12 to 16 times um, you know, a minute. <clears throat> as far as the brain effects, we really need long-term data um, to understand, but we know that there's a lot of effects going on. The next system I want to talk about is the blood system. Um, first of all, I mentioned earlier in the week, but I want to repeat here, absolute lymphocytes is one of the best predictors of outcome. And so we track um, red blood cells and white blood cells every day, and we look at the uh, uh, proportions of each of them. But the absolute number of lymphocytes is something that you, you should keep an eye on. Normally, it's between um, 1 in 4,000. And uh, we, um, on our labs, it would just say 1 to 4 but we're seeing as low as 0 0.2 or 0 0.3, um, which is like two or 300 cells. And so um, just incredibly um, decreased. And uh, we think that that's a, a direct effect of the virus um, attacking our immune systems. But the, uh, the virus is doing more than just attacking the white blood cells. It's attacking the red blood cells and the clotting cascade and, and probably the vessel linings themselves. The linings of the blood vessels are very um, rich in ACE2 cells. And so... Um, uh, we're seeing um, just profound 
um, reaction in our vascular system. Um, one study showed that 38% of patients in the hospital um, had abnormal um, clotting, and one third had actually detected clots in their blood, which is just an incredibly scary thing. And that's one of the reasons we're seeing the D dimers elevated. D dimers are a measure of your body's. Um, Basically, it's breaking down clots, and so we track D-dimer. Um, this study showed a third of patients had a clot, but in our ICU, I think it was close to 100%. We track this on every patient every day, and I, I can't remember a patient who didn't have elevated um, D-dimers. And so we know this is a big portion of the disease, and we're seeing clots. We're seeing patients that even if they heal, um, they have such... Um, uh, decreased blood flow to digits that they're having to get amputations of fingers and toes afterwards because blood flow um, decreases um, so much. The other thing that I want to talk about on the blood section is hypertension and diabetes because it kind of goes with our um, blood vessels. Um, everyone knew coming into this um, epidemic that we should be careful with patients who had lung problems, but a recent study showed um, uh, that patients who were hospitalized, one-third had lung disease, but one-third also had diabetes and 50% had hypertension. And so hypertension was actually a bigger predictor of being hospitalized than lung disease, which I don't think anyone would have predicted coming into this. As a matter of fact, when you look at overall all the risk factors, the four biggest risk factors for being hospitalized with coronavirus were hypertension, diabetes, obesity, and old age. And all these things in one way or the other attack blood vessels. And so we should really uh, pay attention. I've said this before, but if we do have a second wave of this in the fall, all of us should take it as an opportunity to control our diabetes, control hypertension, and control weight. These are all highly associated with bad outcomes. I want to talk a little bit about the heart. Um, we're seeing elevated troponins, which is an um, indicator of a heart attack usually, um, but we're seeing that just kind of normally in our patients. One article showed 20% of patients with COVID in the hospital had heart damage. Another article showed 44% of patients in intensive care units had arrhythmias, meaning that the heart wasn't beating you know, the right way. Um, there's four different ways that coronavirus can hurt the heart, um, probably more, but four high-level things. One is um, there are ACE2 um, cells directly in the heart, so there can be direct attack by the virus. Two is low oxygen, of course, um, is really bad for the heart, which um, needs tons of oxygen to beat as, um, as uh, often as it does. Um, the next thing is a cytokine storm, which can cause like an autoimmune effect on the heart. And then finally, clots. Um, we know that a high percentage of the patients have clots, and if it clots off blood flow to the heart, um, that's kind of a setup for disaster. One kind of teaching point here for docs is to learn how to use a transthoracic um, uh, echocardiogram. Ultrasound has um, has gotten so good these days. Um, we're using at Bellevue Hospital um, TTE or ultrasound directly across the chest wall to look at the heart. And you can do it kind of quickly, um, literally on rounds, go in and look at someone's heart. So if you're not sure if uh, blood pressure issues are due to volume status or um, clotting of the heart or obstruction of the heart or just uh, myocardial dysfunction, you can just place a probe on and look. And it's actually quite easy uh, to get trained on this. So this would be one of the things I'd recommend for people that are going to be working in ICUs taking care of COVID patients is learning how to do uh, um, ultrasound-guided uh, transthoracic echo. I want to talk a little bit about the kidneys. Um, kidneys, once again, are abundant in ACE2 receptors, and so you'll see direct virus attack here. Um, in a lot of different models, renal failure is one of the biggest predictors of death. And tomorrow, um, in probably my last teaching um, session, I'm going to talk about logistics again. And I think the whole country knows we need ventilators, but I don't think the whole country knows that we need uh, more dialysis machines. And so um, one study showed that 27% of patients hospitalized with covid um, ended up going into renal failure and needed dialysis. Another study, even more shocking, showed 59% of patients had protein in their urine, which means they were having damage to the kidney in some way, and 44% had blood in their urine. Um, I think my song a couple days ago addressed this. <laughs> um, but um, certainly um, kidney damage is a big part of the equation with mortality. There's one study that showed AKI, which is known as acute kidney um, injury, that if you had AKI on your admission to the hospital with COVID um, or at any time during your hospitalization, you had a five times increased chance of death, which is uh, pretty scary. Once again, the reason that um, you, you have kidney damage is multifactorial. Um, 
there's direct attack by the ACE2 cells, there's a cytokine storm which attacks the body, ventilators, if you're ventilating the ICU, that's been shown to cause uh, kidney damage, even some of the drugs we're using, like the remdesivir trial, um, while it may attack the virus, it's also um, been shown to be bad for the kidneys. And then there's also underlying diseases like diabetes and even hypertension that are bad for the kidneys. So we're still trying to completely understand the kidney effect, but we know that the kidneys are highly linked to mortality. Let's talk a little bit about the GI tract. Um, the GI tract doesn't get a lot of attention in this disease. Um, <clears throat> but what's interesting is in the original SARS epidemic in 2003, um, uh, we, we, we knew that um, a lot of patients got diarrhea and um, we haven't really talked a whole lot about it in uh, um, this go around with a, a novel coronavirus. But a recent paper showed that um, a significant portion of patients, up to 20% of patients get diarrhea um, with uh, COVID, and um, some people have speculated it could be even higher than as much as 50%. The good news is the risk of fecal transmission continues to remain low, according to all experts. Um, we know that you're shedding um, RNA in the stool, but it's not clear that that stool is actually infecting people, which uh, if that's true, that's, uh, that's good news. I want to talk a little bit about the liver. I'm going to finish with this. Um, you know, the liver um, has been like a big part of our tracking. So in the, in the ICU, we look at liver enzymes every day. Um, there's really there's one really interesting study that was released where they used artificial intelligence to predict outcomes uh, based on um, admissions to the hospital with coronavirus. And they were specifically looking on, at what which patients would uh, move on to ARDS, which is severe lung dysfunction. And one model showed that an increase in ALT was one of the biggest predictors of moving on to ARDS in the lungs. And so it just shows the interconnected nature of our bodies. Um, but we look at AST and ALT and liver enzymes um, panels across the board every day, and we do find that spikes in liver enzymes are uh, predictive of a bad course. And so, um, most experts don't think that it's direct liver attack by the virus, but probably related more to blood clots, blood flow, um, and even the cytokine storm that leads to liver damage. I hope you enjoyed that. Um, uh, it's fascinating just to see this uh, virus's effect on our bodies. And, you know, when I first heard about, you know, COVID, I kind of thought it would be like the flu, like many of you guys. And I thought about the lungs. Um, I had no idea it would have this type of um, far-reaching effects on our body. So I hope you guys enjoyed that. Um, just want to hit a couple other points and I'm going to finish. Um, one, I think tomorrow's going to be my last video. So um, I can't thank you guys enough for following along, but um, tomorrow's going to be day 16. And I always had planned on staying here for like 18 days. And so um, I'm going to go ahead and finish tomorrow. Um, all things have to end. Um, and so um, I appreciate you guys following along and hopefully I'll continue to remain friends with many of you guys uh, going forward. Uh, we have lots of other great cool things that we're doing. Um, I'm probably gonna be going to Africa later this year if we can um, get through all this and um, raise our travel restrictions. And maybe some of you guys will follow me on that journey as well. We work with some great orphanages um, in Africa with my nonprofit. Uh, but I am going to make tomorrow my last uh, video, and I'm going to spend a little bit of time tomorrow talking about logistics. I know I did that before, but I want to dive a little bit deeper on what hospital systems need to do to prepare. Um, and so um, hopefully you'll, uh, you'll join me for that. I want to finish tonight with another video of my son. I got so many amazing emails and messages about my son, Austin, who, um, who struggles with a seizure disorder and autism. And so many people that reached out and told me about similar experiences. And today was a little bit of a down day as far as I felt worse, and I thought a lot about him, and he has up days and down days too, And um, but I feel like he's slowly getting better each day, and he's always an inspiration to me. And so I just wanted to show a quick segment, not an eight-minute video, <laughs> but a quick little segment of um, the most recent video I did of him, and it just shows just incredible progress um, from where he was about a year ago. Um, it's like he's learning to talk again, and you can see it in the video, him... I'm kind of mimicking our talk and saying all sorts of words, and that gives me encouragement. I hope it'll give you encouragement also. Um, I'm going to say goodbye. Thank you guys so much for following along. Um, continue to pray for me and my patients that I'm not with tonight, but pray for them also. And uh, God bless you guys. Stay safe. Goodbye. Hey, Austin, what are you looking for? Hey, come here. Hey, hey. 
Say, I love you, Daddy. I love you, Daddy. What's your name? What is your name? Can you say, Austin? Austin. Hey, look at me. Look at me. Say, hi, Daddy. Hi, Daddy. All right, one more hug. I need a hug. Come over here, hug me. What are you doing? I don't know. What are you doing? Are you going to watch TV? Yes. Hey, who's that lady? Who's this? Can you say mommy? Mommy. Give mommy a kiss. Give it to me. Why not? Why not? Why not? Why not? Give her a kiss. Hey, do you love your mommy? Mommy. Where is she? Where is the <laughs> Yeah. Hey, come here. Will you say hi, daddy? Hi, hi, daddy. Can you say hello? Hello. Kiss your mommy. Give your mommy a kiss. Yeah. I love you. Okay. Hey. Hey, I'll see you later. See you later. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.